네, 안녕하세요. 파울 유입니다. Um, so that's the last Korean you're going to hear from me today. Um, 한국말 할수 있는데 uh, 되게 uh, 불편하니까 영어로 할게요. Uh, so I'm the CFO at 500 Startups. Uh, I've been there for two years. Uh, I've spent my entire career in Silicon Valley. Uh, I was fortunate enough to be born in San Francisco and raised in San Jose, which is the heart of Silicon Valley. So I was very lucky to be immersed in this environment, um, especially on the finance side. And so, um, you know, living in Silicon Valley and, and throughout my career, I've seen the IPO boom and the IPO bust. So in my career, I've been parts of companies that have gone through IPOs. I've helped companies go through mergers and acquisitions, acquiring and selling. And, and I've also been part of companies that have failed, which is not um, unusual in Silicon Valley. Um, so, you know, what I want to share is, you know, what do I do at 500 startups? What is my job? So, I'm basically the happy dancing janitor at 500 startups. I clean up a lot of things at 500. Uh, we're very aggressive in how we're expanding and how we're trying to um, conquer the world. And so, there's a lot of activity and as the finance person and especially for a venture capital firm, uh, there's a lot of rules and regulation and compliance with the SEC and with um, all sorts of government regulations all over the world. And so, um, again, a big component of my job is also figuring out how 500 Startups is going to grow internationally, how we're going to grow and invest in all the different companies that we invest into. Um, one thing that I do not do is I personally don't make the investment decisions, so I don't scout companies, I don't look at their financial statements, I don't manage the financial statements, and I'll talk about that a little bit um, later. But um, again, I'm more focused on our internal operations, which are pretty significant. Um, so most of you hopefully know what 500 Startups is, but I'll talk a little bit about what we do. Uh, so this is a map of where we are. So all the black dots is our people. We have 150 people around the world currently. Um, they help us find great entrepreneurs, great founders, great companies, <clears throat> and also <clears throat> how to um, you know, get connected with the rest of the investment ecosystem. Um, we've got uh, almost 400 million in capital committed across around 15 funds. Um, we've invested to date um, uh, in about 1,800 portfolio companies around the world. And again, it is by far the largest portfolio um, in the world, and uh, we invest annually about four to 500 companies, brand new companies, every year. And so, again, you can see we invest everywhere. And one of the investments that we have is our uh, 500 kimchi fund. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, basically run by our 500 startups Korea team, um, Tim Che and Haley and Min. Uh, help organize and help uh, run our operations in Seoul. Um, but the fund that we have thus far is about a $15 million fund, uh, investing primarily in Korean early stage C to pre-series A um, companies. Um, and we're investing in about 15 companies per year in Korea. Um, we have about 30 companies right now in our portfolio, um, uh, six that were prior to the kimchi fund. And these are some of the examples of the companies that we've invested into. Okay. And one point I want to point out is we don't invest, or we invest in companies that are both just Korea focused as well as, you know, focus on the global markets. Um, I will say that companies that are focused on the global markets based in Korea really have to perform very well because, again, we invest in companies all over the world. If you want to say you're a company that is competing with companies all over the world, you need to be measured to that same standard. Whereas if you're focused on just the Korean market, maybe that might be a little bit easier to, um, to be compared against uh, your peers in the region. So again, we are investing in, in both, both models. Um, so why Korea? Troy, Tebak, these are so good at Korean. Um, um, but you guys already know, you know better than I do why we invest in Korea. Um, so I'm not going to talk too much about that, but I will say that the entrepreneurial spirit is definitely very strong, right? So I think that's something that was really easy for us to um, decide whether or not to come into Korea. Um, so what I wanted to share, uh, again, I'm not an entrepreneur myself. Um, I'm a finance person and I see entrepreneurs all the time, 
But I wanted to share with you kind of my perspectives from what I've seen from our portfolio as well as throughout my career living in Silicon Valley. So the ugly truth of Silicon Valley is that most startups fail, right? So we have, again, four to 500 companies that we invest into every year. And they, um, we have a program where um, about 50 companies uh, come in for four months a year into our office. And I give a speech every quarter. And I tell that group that, hey, of the 50 people or the 50 companies, you know, 40 of you are gonna be dead very soon, right? And it's a very depressing message. Like, I'm not a very happy person to talk to at 500 startups. They don't like me. But I tell them the truth. My model says that 80% of you are going to fail. So, you know, it's a, you, I try to set the expectation that starting a startup in Silicon Valley or anywhere around the world is very, very difficult. Um, another reality of Silicon Valley is that there is a lot of money there but it's really hard to fundraise. Like you really have to know what you're talking about. You really need to understand your company and you need to know who to talk to and how to ask for money the right way. And we actually spend a lot of time with our founders educating them on the right tactics and the right timing and kind of the right metrics as to when to fundraise. So again, it's not like if you move to Silicon Valley, all of a sudden you get tons of money into your bank account. It's not that easy. Um, and then. Troy talked about this a little bit as well, um, but one thing that I noticed in Silicon Valley, um, which is I think different than here in Korea, is the culture is such that um, there's less shame about where you work or how successful you are or what, how successful your company is, right? So if I walk around in a bar in San Francisco, I'll meet people that work for very strange companies that I've never heard of, very unusual products, very unusual services, whatever. I'm the Uber of dog walking, who knows? But there's no embarrassment, right? And I think that's very different than what I grew up with in my family, where all my parents' friends says, oh, Paul went to this school and I'm so proud he has this job at Google or he has this job at Facebook. They wanna brag, right? But in Silicon Valley, it's okay. You can work at some no-name startup company and it's not embarrassing, and it's actually a source of pride. And I think that's something that within Korea, I think is something that will hopefully evolve over time, where you understand and appreciate the significance of working for a no-name startup company. Um, and so again, talking a little bit about the financial aspects of, of uh, working at startups, um, you know, what I've learned from some of the founders, what I've seen, uh, a lot of founders do that have uh, caused them to not be as successful as they could have been, is that um, you know spending for revenue growth. It maybe sounds obvious, but a lot of founders, um, they try to figure out how to be profitable as soon as possible. So they're really worried about, oh my gosh, I only have $100,000 in my bank account or $50,000 in my bank account. I need to get profitable as soon as possible. Now for an early stage investor like 500 Startups, we don't care about profitability. We don't care how much money you're losing. We care about how fast is your revenue growing. Do your customers like your product? Do your customers like your service? You know, how do you prove that, right? Because again, we can solve for the profitability and the efficiency as you grow and as you mature. But at the early stage, we wanna see like, is your product good? Is your service good? So really focusing on growing that revenue very early on is really, really important for, for early stage founders. Um, next, on, you know, again, something I see about founders all the time is founders are very smart people. They're very successful. They've gone to MIT, Harvard, Stanford. They've, they're so smart. But that also comes with a lot of ego sometimes, which means that maybe they don't listen to advice or maybe they don't ask for advice. They, even if they get the advice, they, they say, oh, Paul, you don't know what you're talking about, you're stupid, or I'm no better than you, I'll figure it out. And the reality is, you know, a lot of the founders, maybe they're a product person, maybe they're an engineer, so there's no way they're gonna be an expert on marketing, or an expert on sales, or expert on, on fundraising, right? And so, again, I think that's something where a lot of founders have a, a maybe a hard time adjusting their ego, their pride, um, to actually reach out and ask for help. Uh, Another mistake I see financially from a lot of founders is that they're too cheap, right? So again, I have a small amount of money, I need to grow my company, I need to survive, I need to make payroll, but 
you have to understand your employees and your coworkers are also making investment into you as a founder and investment into the startup. So they're working nights and weekends and early mornings and they don't have a life, they don't have a boyfriend, they don't have a girlfriend because they're working so hard. And so I get a founder who comes to me and says, Paul, I'm thinking about having a pizza party. Can I buy two pizzas Friday night? It's like, why not? I mean, it's, it's you know, I know it's not official business, but again, that's, that's money well spent to make sure your employees are happy and they're working in the right culture because it's more expensive if your employees are unhappy and if they leave, right, to, to replace them. So again, really be thoughtful on how you spend money and how you balance um, the workplace. Uh, so this is one where I experienced this personally. Um, I've been part of startups where we thought we were just doing so well, we don't need to raise money, our revenues are going through the roof, um, so we'll raise money maybe later on when we're um, you know, we've got more revenue growth. Um, and what happens, right? Something changes, the market changes, whatever, then all of a sudden we need money really desperately. Um, and so what happens is we go to the banks, we go to the venture capital community and we say, hey, we need some financing. And then all of a sudden get these really aggressive, non-favorable terms thrown at us as, as a company because we're not in a position of negotiating power, right? Whereas if we had negotiated or asked for fundraising maybe six months earlier, we would be able to say, no, we don't want the money now, we'll wait for a better offer and you can negotiate. But at the last minute, we really can't negotiate because it's either take our deal or die, right? And so again, most founders don't want to deal with fundraising. Dealing with fundraising really, really is terrible. Nobody wants to beg for money, nobody wants to show how well or how poorly they're doing. It's a really painful process. But as a founder, it is really important to focus on that aspect um, for the long-term success of your company. Um, and this is one that I care about personally because, uh, again, we have a portfolio of you know, a, almost a couple thousand. It's really hard to get timely feedback from, timely feedback from, our, um, from our founders, right? So, again, I mentioned that we have, um, I mentioned that we have um, uh, you know, founders that invest in, or sorry, that we've invested in, and they are under the obligation to share with us uh, their financial condition, right? Every quarter, every month, whatever. They tell us, hey, I'm doing well. I have this much revenue this month. I have this much revenue this quarter. This is how much cash I have left. You'd be surprised. There's a lot of founders that don't share that information with us. And I can only imagine it's either because they're too lazy or too busy or embarrassed. Right? I think those are the three reasons why you wouldn't share that information. And what I tell them is, you, you know, the worst case scenario is we get a lot of companies that fail, right? Like I said, 80% of our portfolio will fail. And so if they tell me that they're doing well, that's actually surprising news to me. Like, wow, you're actually doing okay. I expect you all to be dying, right? But so when they share the news with me that Paul our company is struggling, our financials aren't good, we don't have cash, that's okay, because now we have a chance to figure out a solution with them, right? We can say, hey, let me introduce you to these other venture capital firm that might be willing to invest. Or maybe have you tried this tactic with your marketing or your sales? And again, we would love to have the opportunity to help save them, as opposed to getting the email after the fact saying, sorry, we died, too bad, right? And you know, I'll talk a little bit more a little bit later why that's so important to have that good relationship with your investors and to be honest and transparent as much as you can. Um, so I have about six minutes left. So this is a concept that again I talk about what's um, you know at least my understanding of Korean culture you know how much pride we have how much drive we have to be successful and to be considered the best at what we do and so as an entrepreneur or as a founder it's really intimidating to say like, okay, I'm gonna fail or I might fail at this venture, right? So what does it mean to actually fail um, you know, as a startup, right? It means, hey, you created jobs for a group of people for a while, right? So that's great. You, know, you got to create your own company culture and you got to um, be your own boss and you got to work in an environment that you really enjoyed, right? Working on something that you think is really important. Um, 
you know, experience as an entrepreneur, we, when we invest and make our investment decisions, more often than not, we invest in the founder more than the product itself, more than the service. We wanna know how good is this team? Are they experienced? Have they started a company before? If so, have they learned from their mistakes, right? So you can only learn from your mistakes if you actually make a mistake first, right? You have to fail in order to figure out how to do things the right way. Um, and again, like I was talking about on the last slide, the meaningful relationships with investors and entrepreneur community, right? Being a startup founder puts you in a very, very cool club. You get to talk to other startup founders, you get to do networking, you get to learn a lot from these people, and you get to talk to a lot of rich people with a lot of money, and you get to establish a relationship with them. You know, sure, they may not give you money, invest in this company, but maybe your second startup or your third startup or your fifth startup, maybe then they're gonna figure out like, oh yeah, I remember this guy from 10 years ago, I'm gonna invest in him now. And that sort of experience and exposure is so valuable. It's really, really important, right? And so, again, I think, you know, when you think back to, okay, gosh, I failed as a startup founder, I think it's really important to understand what that means. And frankly, you know, we, you know, that's something that even growing up for me, whenever I would go at whatever the startup I worked at, my mom would always ask me, like, what is this startup? Like, how do I know this company is going to be alive in one year or two years? Why don't you go work for Google or work for IBM or Apple? It's like, no, that's boring, right? Like, I don't, I don't want to do that, right? And, you know, in America, it's okay, right? It's okay to work for a place that fails. And I think that's a cultural thing, again, that is really, really um, significant in Silicon Valley. Um, so I'm wrapping up now, but this uh, quote, I think, encapsulates what 500 Startups is about. When Dave McClure and Christine Tsai started the firm seven years ago, they were not experienced venture capitalists. They don't, they don't have a lot of money, or they didn't have a lot of money. But they said, you know what, we really want to invest in companies all over the world. We want to build the ecosystems all over the world. We really want to change the world. Like, that was their mission. And they didn't know how to do it, but they tried. And I think we like to pass along that same sort of culture and mentality to the founders all over the world, right? Give you guys money, support you guys, but really give you the confidence that you guys can maybe have a chance to make this happen for yourselves, right? Whether it be here in Korea or in Indonesia or in Ghana or Nigeria, we really believe that there's smart people all over the world that are worth investing into, right? There's, again, we've invested in 1,800 companies, but trust me, there's thousands more of ideas that we haven't invested in and thousands of really great entrepreneurs that we haven't met yet. And so for at least for us at 500, we're really looking forward to investing in many new entrepreneurs and hopefully they have the confidence to break the traditions and not work for the next big company and actually take a chance and, and follow their dreams and their vision. So again, I wish you all the best of luck and thank you for uh, listening to me.